saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels who had in their power to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their, on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed, out of every tribe of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000. Of the tribe of Aser, 12,000. Of the tribe of Nephtali, 12,000. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. Of the tribe of Sabulon, 12,000. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 sealed. After this, I saw a great multitude, which no man could number, out of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and with palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing round about the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving, and honor and power and strength to our God forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for the Holy Gospel. Continuation of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. At that time, Jesus, seeing the crowds, went up the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the earth. Blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for justice, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. Blessed are they who suffer persecution for justice' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men reproach you and persecute you, and speaking falsely say all manner of evil against you for my sake. Rejoice and exult, because your reward is great in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady, seat of wisdom, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. My dear friends, being that many of you probably have to work, the sermon has to be short. Today, the church reminds us that we are citizens of the world to come, that this is not our home, that this is not our main country, that we are indeed citizens of heaven, and that's where we belong. And the church opens to us these doors for a, for a while, a little glimpse, so we can remember that our brethren are there, my friends are there, my parents are there, my brothers and sisters are there up in heaven. And here the world is just a temporal time, of trial. Our lives become difficult sometimes as Catholics because we live in a world where we have to fight for our sanctity and our salvation in the middle of a midst where we can't see the truth as we should or as we would like rather. We can't see heaven and hell and the threats that, that threaten our soul when we sin. But faith opens that door to us and faith shows us that truth. And today, my dear friends, the church is reminding you, you do not belong to this world. You do, not, you do not belong here. This is not your home. Your home is in heaven. You are called to heaven. When you were baptized, a ticket was given you to heaven. Every time that you go to communion, you could say a piece of real estate is saved for you in heaven. That's where you have all your assets, all your treasures. At least, at least that's where we should have them. And in as much as we forget, we might lose it. In the same way that if you have a bank account and if you forget about it, you might lose that money. So my dear friends, here is the exercise of your faith renewed in today's feast, that you think of how important it is that that is where all your priorities should be, 
in saving your soul in going to heaven. I said that we all had a vocation to heaven. I always get fascinated by this aspect of science, you could say, where they tell you that every fingerprint is unique and that the, the print also in your retina, in your eye, is unique. And that is a marvelous thing when you think about it, that there is billions of people in the world and not one is repeated. Everyone has their own fingerprint, their own uh, eye configuration. And I think that is purposely made by God to show us that he creates each one of us uniquely, mindfully thinking of you. That when God made you, he had you in mind and you alone. And in the same way that your body has unique features, your soul also has unique features. How can we not believe that? And that means that from the very beginning, God made you, knowing who you were, knowing how you would be. And in that particular way, with all the things around you, you were called to become one kind of a saint, you. Not any other saint will be like you. You are supposed to be your one unique kind of saint. And that's a beautiful thing when you think about it. Oftentimes the devil would discourage us to pursue sanctity. He will say, it's too late for you. You're too old. Or you are too much of a sinner, too big of a sinner. Or you're just too little of a thing. You shouldn't worry about those things. Don't let the devil say those lies to you. God made you from the beginning to become a saint and nothing less. The devil will also discourage us sometimes saying, but you're not like St. Teresa of Avila. You're not like St. Francis of Assisi. You're not like St. Ignatius of Loyola. All their circumstances are so different from you. When have you heard of a saint driving a car to work, preparing a class during the night, uh, getting ready to do school work? When have you heard of a saint paying taxes or worrying about uh, putting food in the table for tomorrow? That's a lie too, my dear friends. Because as I said, you are supposed to become your own kind of saint. And our Lord has called you in such a way that your family, the time where you live, your character, your temperament, your bad temper if you have it, or your soft temper if you do, even your sins and your mistakes are meant to be used from now on, are meant to be used so that you can sanctify yourself. Be sorry for your sins, fight against your vices, practice the virtues that are easier to you in order to get to the ones that are not as easy, and use everything around you to become a saint, as our Lord has called you to be. It is important for us to understand this, that we're not supposed to be exactly like someone else. When we were in the seminary, I remember this one seminarian and religious, I've told this story like a thousand times, so I'm sorry if I repeat it. There was this one seminarian that was the picture of a perfect seminarian. That wasn't me, obviously. He was very, very uh, devoted, uh, very disciplined, very serious at all times. In classes, he would be sitting up straight and always studying. Just the perfect picture. And he was very, as I said, a very serious character. Well, there was this other seminarian that was very sanguine, uh, not as serious. I would say also devout, also, you know, trying to work virtue, but a very particular character, very, very different from the other one. And at a certain point, this one seminarian tried to be like the serious one. And he spent in that, let's say, a two, good two, three months saying, I'm going to do everything that he does. I'm going to kneel like he does. I'm going to pray like he does. I'm going to even talk like he does. Well, there's a fable that speaks about this. It was a total disaster. A total disaster. People didn't like him. People started, you know, thinking him was a phony, obviously. And just things didn't work out. Devotion didn't work out for him either in that way. Because he was supposed to be, yes, funny and sanguine and a totally different character than this one over here. We're all called to be saints in different ways. But my dear friends, there is one thing that all saints have in common. Obviously, the theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity. But also, these jewels that our Lord gives today in the gospel, what we call the eight Beatitudes. Let me get into that by making a brief introduction. 
The Protestant Reformation, the, the Protestant deformation, I should say, changed the way in which people see the gospel. If you talk to a Protestant, and if you talk to a person from Vatican II, not everyone, but a lot of them, they insist in the gospel only as the good news. For the Protestants, the gospel is a piece of information. It's a piece of information where they tell you, here it is, Christ died for you, all you have to do is accept him, and then you go to heaven. It's just news. For the Catholics, the gospel is not just news. It is also a new law, a new covenant. It is something that prompts us, that commands us to act. How important it is, my dear friends, for us as Catholics to remember this, that the view of the Protestants is a one-sided view of the gospel, Paul's, and that the Catholic Church sees the gospel for what it is. Yes, the good news, but also the new law, a new commandment given to you. And this is where you see today's Beatitudes. It's our Lord's instructive, our Lord's manual to be happy. I said the sermon needed to be short. But if you want to understand the Beatitudes, you could see them as a glance in this way. They are the antithesis, antithesis to the world's maxims. The world has its maxims, its, ma its mantras, its mottos. Our Lord is telling, telling you here in the Beatitudes, everything that the world tells you, it's the opposite. The world says, be rich, get wealthy, get as many things as you can, have a lot of power. Our Lord says, be poor in spirit. The world says, impose yourself, win, rule over others. Our Lord says, be meek and you'll be happy. The world tells you pleasures, parties, have a lot of fun, spend a good time, eat a lot, drink a lot. The world says, so our Lord says, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for sanctity. The world says to you, make everyone like you, be very popular with people. Make sure that everyone thinks well of you, that no one says bad things about you, that you're normal, that you're part of it, that you're in the clique. Our Lord says to you, blessed are they who suffer persecution for justice sake. Blessed are you when they speak ill against you falsely. Blessed are you when people despise you for my sake. Then you're happy. Notice then, my dear friends, our Lord is telling you everything that the world tells you it's the opposite. Today, as we go out into the world, to our jobs, to our schools, to whatever we do, be comforted, my dear friends, because as a Catholic, yes, you are not supposed to be considered as normal. You're not supposed to be popular. Your family is not all supposed to love you. Your friends are not all supposed to agree with you because you're not in this country. You're not from this world. You're not from this earth. Your home is somewhere else. Your family is somewhere else. Today, let's follow the saints in that path that they set for us. The path, not only of learning the gospel, but of putting it, in, putting it in practice. With what? With poverty, as our Lord did. With obedience, as our Lord did also. With chastity, as our Lord also bid us do. In, a, in as much as we can in our state. And most importantly, putting first and foremost in our life, the love of God and then the love of our neighbor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.